Good morning, beautiful being. It is lovely to see you inside here. Out of the rain, because it really is raining out there, and I decided not to walk to the top of the hill, take a picture of the non-view, and come home as a slightly drowned rat. Hence, I'm here. Um, and so that means we're doing rocks, and we're doing this one first. Mm. This is a big one. Well, it's a moderately sized one. But everybody always goes, ooh, because it's got big points in it. Of course, this is just plain old garden variety quartz. But isn't it beautiful? So here it is. And, um, yeah, I'm enjoying showing it to you. It's beautiful. There's nothing more to do than to just turn it around. You can actually see right through it. It's got a hole in it. It's got several holes in it. And um, if you look at the base, there it is. And there's one of the, you know, there's the other side of the hole. Um, it's just lovely to show you a big old piece of quartz. Good morning, beautiful being. It's great to see you on this rainy Monday morning with my big piece of quartz to share. I mean, look, this is really quite see-through. You can see my finger. G'day, Mike. My finger is waving at you <laughs> through the quartz crystal. So there it is. It's lovely to see you. This is probably the poster shot because um, you can just see the shapes really well. Good morning, Abigail. There it is. So we're doing rocks today because it's wet in Wellington today. And the other one we're doing, it's a lot smaller, but very, very interesting. This is one from my friend Jenny Paolo. Now, the little label says this is azurite pseudo after calcite from the DRC, which is the Dominican Republic of Congo. So what that means, um, a pseudomorph is something that looks like something that was previously there, but it's not that thing anymore. So I'm going to try and show this to you. See these pointy shapes? Those are, or were, calcite. But something is the label. Something has happened to this. You know, there's been a lot of copper floating around. And the calcite's gone away. And it's been replaced with azurite in the shape of calcite. So it's very cool. I don't know how well you can see it in the light. The light's not brilliant. Probably be better if I had natural light. If I didn't have the lights on this morning. Um, but there it is, it's this beautiful, just so interesting, and I can't help thinking that the very sparkly green crystals in there are um, diopside. I don't know, but they're certainly gorgeous. Good morning, Kelly! Kylie, I'm sorry, I do get you mixed up until you until I see your little hello in the comments or whatever it is, and then I can work it out. But I know it's one of you, so good morning, and I'm sure the other one of you will see me very soon. It's not that you're both the same, it's just that I get you mixed up. Because your names start with K. Um, and, you know, that's just my brain. It's my problem. You are not the same. So look at this beautiful blue. And it's got these bits of brown in it. And it's not actually white. It's sort of a, um, it's like the white is stained with the green. It's just so interesting. I love this. And these are the calcite pseudomorphs. It's like in the shape of dog's tooth calcite, but it's green. Because it's azurite that's making those shapes. In fact, it's... It's sort of green and it's sort of blue. Um, so it's a stone that you can look at a lot because it's like a landscape. Um, and it just, I just, when I was picking stones today, um, I was thinking, I, I was seeing malachite. And I don't have a big piece of malachite, um, but I, I saw this and thought, right, <laughs> this is not the same, but close enough. It's beautiful. So that's those are our rocks today, just two, the big one and the really interesting one. And today I want to talk about criticism, and this is actually the live that didn't happen because my phone broke, my old phone broke a week or so ago, um, and I had the words and I just stashed it away for somewhere for some time when it would be useful. Um, and last Friday I was it was late and I was kind of brain dead, and I thought, ah, right, must be time to do that. So I want to talk about criticism today, um, and. The interesting thing about criticism is that it only hurts, really, if there's something inside me that agrees with whatever 
the person or the situation or the circumstance or the whatever it is has given me the opportunity to believe is true. Um, it really is truly about my reaction, my response, how I feel in response to whatever that person or that situation or that circumstance engenders for me. Because, you know, we think about criticisms of being nasty people, and there are nasty people who, you know, dump shit, okay? But to give you a, a very real, tangible example for me, you know, I've lived in this house since 1989? No, I was 21 when I got here. 1987, right? Or 1988, I can never quite remember which. 1988, I've been here since 1988. Um, that's a long time now, comparatively speaking, you know, in terms of my lifespan and how long I've been alive, it's a long time. Um, and the house was tatty when we got here. And you know what? <laughs> There's a new kitchen and this room is, was done up, I don't know, 15 years ago. And the rest of it is still just as tatty. In fact, more so because it's had all that wear and tear. Now, the very thought of having someone around to, to visit that hasn't seen me for 10 years actually brings up a response that would be equivalent to being tatty is old, worn, T-A-T-T-Y, tired, threadbare carpets, wallpaper, you know, and, and that, that needs replacing, bits peeling, stuff's not done, seriously needs renovating. Um, I mean, you, you see what, what the laundry's like when I walk through it. That was like that when we moved in. We had some work done, and it's never been finished because it's not going to be finished in the shape that it is. Um, I at least know how the house is going to be now. But, you know, that's a whole other story. The point being that um, when I have the thought of, of inviting somebody around here that was here 10 years ago and hasn't seen it for 10 years, in me... The reaction is, oh, gee, I'm ashamed of my house. Nothing's happened, really. I mean, you know, we've had the windows done. I'm so grateful. They don't leak. They're lovely. Um, you know, there's all this chatter that goes on in my head about, oh, gee, they must think that we're slobs and we don't care. And, you know, what I've been doing for 10 years, not tidying this place up. Well, there's a reason. I've made choices and he's made choices. We've made choices about how we live our lives, which means that we haven't had the resources to do that. And I know those choices have been right for me. But when it comes to seeing someone they haven't seen for 10 years and in my head thinking, what are they going to think about me? Because the house is the same except older and tireder as, they, as it was the last time they were here. You know, there's all this stuff comes up inside me. And fundamentally, I criticize myself. Never mind what anyone else might think or not. It's irrelevant. The, the dialogue's inside me, how I feel about it. Because I extrapolate, you know, but it's me. It's my stuff. Um, and so, you know, and so it's not necessarily people because they they probably would notice. But they, what they think is, is their, their thing. But in me, there is that sensitivity. It's like, oh, gee, you know, I haven't even got that done after all this time. So we have these internal dialogues and conversations and default mode networks inside our heads and in our bodies, memorized in our bodies about how we feel about certain things. And when somebody outside of us does something that ratifies that, affirms it, puts it outside of us and holds up a big ugly mirror and shows us this is how you really feel about yourself, but you've been not paying attention to it because you don't know how to shut it up, you can't stop it. You know, I'm not saying this is... Oh, beat up on yourself because, you know, here's this mirror and it's showing you something that's awful and, you know, you didn't do anything about it. I'm saying this this is why it hurts, because it affirms something in us that we actually already believe and we don't realize it. Carmelina, good morning. And then there it is, you know, the person or the circumstance shows us something about ourselves that's owie. And it's like, ugh. Um, and so I'm really aware of that one. I am, you know. <laughs> Um, and it's something I have to continue to overcome in myself and decide, well, who am I? Am I the person? And, and this is this is the way, this is the only way to really overcome criticism. 
is to be so certain about who you are and who you're choosing to be and the choices you've made and all of that, that it doesn't matter what other people think. And that can be very, very difficult. You know, if you've grown up with a critical parent and it's implicitly wired in your body and your brain that you're crap or whatever it is, I'm not saying this is easy. But if you come to a place inside yourself where you simply don't care and you are so sure about who you're choosing to be and why, well, then the criticism has no power over you. And it's just like, yeah, whatever, you know. Fine, you can think what you like. I just don't care. It just doesn't matter to me. And it goes beyond saying, oh, I don't care. You know, piss off. Think what you like. You still care if there is charge in your reaction, in your response to that, you know. It's only when you think, well, yeah, they can think what they like. I know what I've chosen. I know why I've chosen it. And I'm okay with it. So this is, this is the thing. And what criticism does infallibly always is it brings up any sense of unworthiness inside us criticism makes us feel unworthy fundamentally we feel unworthy you know whatever it is yeah so we have the reaction and you gotta know just like I do that it's something about me that I don't feel good about um yeah, and, the, and you see, the old criticisms from decades ago, of course, they're not really old, are they? I mean, they happened back then, but they're still alive in our brains and our bodies. And, I mean, nobody said to me, you're a bad, lazy, slack person if your house isn't pretty. I decided that myself. And I'm the person that keeps reinforcing that now. And along with it goes the whole thing of, oh, it'll never happen, it's going to cost too much, I can't make that much money, you know, tra-la-la-la-la, all of which is more about failure, okay? Fundamentally, it's still unworthiness. And on the other side of that, I have to look at myself and who I am choosing to be, and I have to make a very clear decision. Am I going to focus on my past? And we talked about this on Friday. The failures of my past. Good morning, Jen. Lovely to see you. You know, the, the, the multiple times I've tried to, you know, I talked about that last week, or was it the week before, serial failure. But you see, I don't, I don't actually feel bad about that because I know what that's been for. I know why. I know how that serves me um, because it's leading me to my success. But I still have this other stuff that goes on. So, you know, all of these things contribute and we have the thought about ourselves um, and it's now because we keep it going. And the triggers in our environment serve to keep it going in us. And we fire up the same old thoughts and we have the same old feelings. And it's always unworthiness. Really, fundamentally at the bottom of everything is unworthiness. So for me, I have to remember, okay, I've had these, these experiences. I'm going through my life. Um, I'm making choices very consciously about, no, I'm not going to go and get a 40-hour a week job. Because if I do that... I can't do what I'm doing, which I've very consciously chosen to do because it's what I want to do, but it's had these ramifications because I'm not doing the 40-hour-a-week job making the money, um, which keeps me sort of safe and secure, but doesn't allow me to follow my passion and what's in my heart and would slowly kill me because I wouldn't be doing what I came here to do. So it's a really powerful choice to do what I came here to do, not knowing how it's going to create enough wealth for me to do up my house, never mind anything else. It's the only thing I want to do, do up my house. Is it? After that, it's just, you know, serve more people. For myself, that's the only thing. Um, so, you know, I have to decide, and so do you, in every moment that this stuff comes up. Sanchia, good morning, sweetie. Um... Am I going to be defined by the failures and the losses and the can'tness and the unworthiness of my past and continue to go, oh, poor me, really? And Oh, I wish it was different. And Oh, I'm so frustrated. It hasn't happened yet. And, you know, and we all know those thoughts that we consistently think when we feel criticized, whether it's by just looking out the window and seeing that, you know, I looked at the fence that I photographed with the picture. I thought, oh, my God, it looks so tired. It needs a clean. It needs, you know, and I thought, no, 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 I'm just not going there. Because that's about what I haven't been able to do yet. 
And the me that I am now consciously creating has done that. And I got to choose whether I invest my energy in who I've been or who I'm becoming. Holly, good morning, sweetie. That's it. I don't have a choice in the matter. I have to make a choice. Who, I, who am I? And if I invest my energy in who I'm becoming, even though you might say, okay, let's say it never works, nothing ever changes, and I just keep on investing my energy in who I'm becoming. It's not possible for nothing to change, by the way. If I do that, I'm changing myself neurologically and therefore biochemically and genetically. I have to change. But let's say that the impossible happens and nothing changes except that I continue to choose to invest my energy and my attention in who I'm going to be instead of who I've been. Hey, I feel better. If I do nothing else, I feel better. And the downward causation of that over time is positive. End of story. So it really boils down to breaking the addiction biochemically, neurologically, genetically, the whole thing, breaking the addiction to who I've been. And there are all those triggers in the environment. You know, I walk through my house every day. And a lot of those triggers don't go off anymore because um, I am creating the self. I am doing my... No, doing most is the wrong word. I am very determined and very committed to the process of more and more becoming this me that feels like the house is done up, it's beautiful, everything's taken care of, I can pay people to do the work that we, between us, haven't had the time to do or the resources do or whatever it is for all this time. You know, I can walk through my life as that person or I can walk through my life as the person that feels small and frustrated and shamed because the house still isn't done after 30 years. That's my choice. I have no choice in the matter about that. I have a choice. Who am I going to be? And if I invest my energy in the old me, I feel shame and I feel unworthy. If I invest my energy in the new me, I don't. I feel worthy. I feel like I have it. And i got way more opportunities to actually create it if I am in the space of having this than if I'm in that space of lack. So that's the only thing that, that criticism really shows to me personally of any sort. And most of it's internal because I'm very grateful. I don't have to be around unpleasant, nasty, negative people. You know, I that I have crafted my life like that. That is one of the reasons why I got out of the full time workplace because I didn't want to be around nasty people. Now, I could have manifested myself a happy full-time workplace if I wanted by now but I don't want that I'm working part-time because it allows me to do something else as well and that has financial ramifications so this is who I've chosen to be and I've chosen and I'm so aware of this right now I have chosen to say I'm going to to be more in love with the unknown that I can't predict. I don't know how it's going to happen. And frankly, it looks impossible because where the hell is that money going to come from in my current situation? Based on everything I know, it's never going to happen. Um, because that's everything I know. That's the past. Or, you know, I, I can trust the unknown. That which I cannot predict. Kylie, it's you, honey! Yeah, happiness within, no matter what's happening around. And, and, and choosing, it's not my truth and what's real in my imagination. This is actually which future am I aligning myself with? The one where I'm still who I was, still too scared to take a risk, to whatever. Or the me that says, hey, there is more support than I know. There is more resource than I can imagine. I don't know how it's going to come to me. But I know who I'm going to be in 10 years' time if I stay who I've been. And I don't want to be that person. As much as I love her for getting me here, I don't want to do that anymore. I have to become somebody else if I want a different future. And it means going into the unknown, and it's unfamiliar, and it's fearful. <laughs> I tell you. I was on Batoni Beach doing my walking meditation on um, Saturday morning and I bumped head on into fear. It was like walking through a howling gale. I just walked through it and left it behind me. 
It's like, this has to end. I'm not doing this anymore. I don't want to be this person anymore. I've got to be somebody else. And all the criticism and the voices and everything are inside my own head. Nobody's saying it to me. And fundamentally, that's all that happens with you. Is that there can be triggers outside. But ultimately, it's how you react and how you respond and who you choose to be. Each time that happens, is you're choosing your past or your future. Morning, Andrew. Lovely to see you. So, yeah, sometimes it's a very deep decision. I mean, you have to make a deep decision. Clearly, I've made a deep decision. I cannot continue to be who I've been. I just can't. I, I won't. Because I know, I, I know where that's leading. But the future that I'm choosing is actually scary because it's unknown. It, it means me being a person I've never been before and doing things I've never done before and would never contemplate as my old self. Um, and that's scary. But it's also congruent with who that person is. If I am being my future self, my future self is very different from my past self. And I'm kind of one of those forks on the road at the moment. Um, and I know who I'm choosing to be. So, you know, we have to choose to either succumb to the internal voice, which can be represented externally, sure, but fundamentally it's inside your own head and your own heart that you feel the unworthiness and go, oh, God, you've got to overcome that emotion, get your energy and your attention and your eh out of the past and focus on who you're becoming. Otherwise, you just stay the way it is. There isn't a choice in that matter. There's only a choice about what you choose. <laughs> You're going to do something. The question is what? So, yeah. That turns out to be my rave about criticism. It's always about you. It's fundamentally that some part of us feels unworthy. And we have to overcome that emotion one way or another and choose who it is we want to be and how that feels, even when it's scary. And make a very conscious choice. Well, who am I being today? So that's what I wanted to say. Um, if you aren't aware that I'm on YouTube and you like YouTube and find it useful, please jump on YouTube and find me. Um, give me a subscription if you wish. Or realize that the videos are there and you can look them up, you can search, and that's easier to do there than it is on Facebook. Thank you so much for watching, for joining in. I appreciate you sharing me very much. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.